Welcome to IDKD Refreshes Series, Pre- and Post-Aortic Endovascular Interventions, What a Radiologist Needs to Know. My name is Thorsten Blei, Professor of Radiology at the University of Würzburg in Germany. That is the place where Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen discovered X-rays in 1895. Today I will discuss with you a case of a 65-year-old gentleman with abdominal aortic aneurysm who was scheduled for EVA, endovascular aortic repair. His medical history includes coronary heart disease, triple bypass surgery, arterial hypertension, diabetes type 2, respiratory insufficiency, and he has a history of smoking. Now prior to EVA, we want to assess some anatomic considerations. How is the proximal and landing, distal landing zone configured? What about the aneurysm morphology? What about the excess vessels that lead to the aneurysm? We want to look exactly at the landing zone morphology. Are there calcifications? Is there a thrombus? How is the neck organized? Is it tapered or reverse tapered? What about the iliac arteries? Are they torches in their course? So the, it will be difficult to maneuver the material, the stent graft, which is quite big, towards the aorta. Is the internal iliac artery patent or does it need to be occluded because it will be overstented by the leg of the stent graft? What about calcifications at the excess site at the common femoral artery where the puncture will be taking place? These considerations are initially in every report and essentially in there. Now, in the procedure itself, everything went well. You can see images prior and post deployment of the stent graft, occluding the aortic aneurysm. In surveillance imaging, after TIVA or EVA, we want to assess potential complications, which include aneurysm sac increase if there's an endoleak, and we will discuss different types of endoleaks in a minute. Is the stent graft migrated, ruptured, or infected? Is there a false aneurysm in the excess vessel? These five points need to be addressed in every surveillance imaging report. In our case, at six weeks post EVAR, you see here a non-contrast, arterial phase and later phase contrast enhanced CT scan, and you probably readily see the endoleak. And what type of endoleak do you see? This is the sagittal reformate, and you can see the inferior mesenteric artery coming all the way to its origin. And this is a type 2 endoleak due to reverse flow of the inferior mesenteric artery. Now there are different types of endoleaks, as I said earlier. Type 1 is a high pressure endoleak due to persistent flow outside the graft lumen into the aneurysm sac. In the proximal landing zone, it would be a type 1a endoleak in the distal landing zone, type 1b endoleak, if there is improper alignment of the stent graft with the inner wall of the aortic wall. Type 2 endografts, endoleaks are more frequent and they are low pressure endoleaks due to reverse flow, as in our case, of, for example, the inferior mesenteric artery or lumbar arteries. Type 3 endoleaks are high pressure endoleaks due to rupture of the stent graft material or misalignment at the junction of the leg with the main body. If there is misalignment, aortic blood flow could be directed straight into the aneurysm sac. That's a high pressure endoleak that needs to be addressed immediately, typically with stent in stent. Type 4 endoleaks would be due to porosity of the stent graft mesh. That is rarely seen nowadays. And type 5 endoleaks is also rarely seen, is when there is increase in aneurysm sac volume and we don't see any contrast leaking into the aneurysm sac. So most important and most often is the type 2 endoleak and uh, immediately to treat are type 1 and type 3 endoleaks due to their high pressure. Back to our case, we already have seen the six weeks follow-up scan and now the one year follow-up scan reveals one more finding. But first of all, how do we measure the aneurysm sac? Well, ideally, it would be a 3D volumetric analysis. However, in my department, due to the high volume, we can only do perpendicular diameter measurements to assess volume increase. 
Now in this particular case, there is one more new finding that can also be assessed in the 3D BRT image. And that is, as you have already seen, the thrombosis of the right leg of the graft. That is um, displayed here. You can virtually look through this dead graft because there is no contrast in the right leg. It's only thrombosis. Now, follow up at two years and two and a half years revealed one more finding. And that is new gas bubbles within the aneurysm sac. And that is truly concerning. And if you look closely, there is also a psoas muscle abscess that continues all the way to the lumbar spine. And if you look back to the two years image, you may now reveal there is stranding on the posterior aspect of the aortic aneurysm. And that is an early sign, potential early sign of infection. So this patient had an endoleak type 2, stent graft thrombosis of the right leg, graft infection with a psoas abscess and spondylitis of the lumbar spine, and he needed open surgery. The stent graft had to be taken out. In a concomitant case with an aortic prosthesis that was infected, FDG PET readily revealed vivid FDG uptake in the prosthesis. And interestingly, that is not as well seen in the CT image. Actually, there's no gas bubble, there's no fluid around it, and there's no vivid sign of stranding. So FDG is much more sensitive in assessing infection of the stent graft or prosthesis. This patient also needed surgery and this prosthesis was taken out and an aorto iliac venous graft was inserted by our vascular surgeon Dr. Bühler who also gave me these infooperative images. Graft or prosthesis infection risk factors include diabetes, renal insufficiency, immunocompromised patients, increased length of prosthesis or stent graft and endoleaks and some of which applied to our patient as well. Incidence is depending on the material, prosthesis 0.6 to 5% or endografts less than 1%. And mortality is high. And conservative treatment is 35 to 45% and in surgical therapy 20 to 30%. And costs are high as well. So we want to make sure to find signs of infection if there is a graft or prosthesis infection. And those signs include increasing periprosthetic or peristent fluid, persistent anew gas bubbles, as we have seen in our case, partial graft thrombosis, as we have seen in our case, pseudoaneurysm stranding, which we have also seen in our case, and dilatation. And if in doubt, FDG PET is the most sensitive technique to detect inflammation. And if it's not available, leukocyte skin is a good alternative. Now, thank you very much for your attention, and I very much hope to see you again in person next time in Davos at 80KD. Thank you very much.